Thank you, Winka, for the invitation and the honor of showing up in September when you are all full of energy. Um, buildings and Almost Buildings is about questions we've been asking for a long time, about the objective aspects of architecture and its subjective experience. After we built Canopy at MoMA PS1 in 2004, we would hang out like flies on the wall, anonymous spectators of the activities around us. We had conceived Canopy as a framework, really, for the microclimates and social exchanges, but without hard boundaries or overt function. We thought of it and our other early installations as almost buildings, buildings that invite transformation or interpretation by others by the users and the misusers, whom we started to call the ones who TP'd the canopy, or this guy who sent us this unsolicited um, slide of himself, um, the users and misusers who had appropriated our installation as their own. Keep going. I'm just At the end of the summer. The Not. This is going to be Sorry decapitated. That, I don't think it will work. Yeah. Franklin knows how this works. Terrence is coming. Ah, does that happen? Something. Users and misusers. Yeah, I'm just trying to feel like it's raining. <laughs> ah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you, Inka. Much better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. At the end of the summer, we sold the bamboo to Matthew Barney, who used it as scaffolding in his upcoming movie. At the time, we were just trying to recoup some of our debt. Um, from building Canopy, but in hindsight, we loved the fact that it went from being one armature to another. So is architecture necessarily complete ever? Or is it a state of indeterminacy that incites us to engage with it? Whereas we made our early installations as building-like as possible, we're trying to embody in the more permanent work the attributes of the almost building and asking the question, can they remain incomplete and embrace ambiguity in positive ways? So at what level, um, at what point is architecture complete? It's a question that has evolved alongside philosophical and scientific uh, concepts of space over the last 100 years. Um, and we ask uh, it through three different frameworks, the armature, the boundary, and the zone. So at its <coughs> most reduced, architecture is often represented as an armature. Um, and Logier's primitive hut vies with the cave and nest as a kind of potential origin for architecture. We see these as almost buildings, Winka, as something that's between something and a building, and therefore something else. And the fact that they're missing something is what excites us, because we uh, imagine them as armatures that are capable of constant re reconfiguration. We're interested in the social aspects, in that uh, you know, they're awaiting the enactment of their potential. But we're also interested in the form, in the uncertainty, and the informal, and the open-ended. Uh, in the 1960s, the armature was promoted to megastructure, uh, allowing for sort of an easy expansion from uh, building to city. But we are interested in the idea of the armature, the finite scale of a building, where uh, surface and, um, and envelope, where, where field and surface meet. At least, usually, because in the case of this competition, which we did along with uh, your fellow faculty member, James Corner, field operations, we uh, actually proposed a kind of, we thought it was a good idea to propose a 2,000 foot long armature on Detroit's waterfront. Uh, we explained that it could be built uh, slowly over time, uh, something that I think the jury missed that nuance, so we didn't win. <laughs> so open porch, as we call it, is an armature that we thought would help the city's goal of revitalization in terms of occupying and densifying uh, existing empty lots. We imagined it really as a kind of a threshold condition uh, between and sort of a catalyst of activity for the city. So after searching for a lot of formal variation and ways to break down the form, we kind of concluded that the variation itself would come from the appropriation and the way it's used. Um, and so we, so we basically looked for a way to kind of uh, to keep in tension the use and the kind of a, a very legible form. So a, glue, a, a framework of glue lamp timber and steel stretching 2,000 feet long unites a series of amenities uh, and also services and, and smaller buildings beneath it uh, to basically promote this, create this kind of edge and almost building something between a park and, and a building. And so given the progress of the city's uh, ongoing transformation, we thought it a good idea that it could be completed over time. Uh, it's a project that defies kind of representation at some level, so we uh, show it in this way as a kind of continuous unfolding uh, porch 
intimate in some places, but endless in others, a kind of work in um, perpetual progress. So a few uh, years later, after, uh, or maybe a year later after losing Detroit, we uh, secured a real commission to create a kind of uh, a long armature sorts. And this is a project that should be breaking ground in probably early th this fall. It's supposed to be completed uh, in, in a year. It's called the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center. It's a long single story building that acts as a kind of armature for exhibitions uh, that will educate the public about correlations between nature and energy, both positive and negative uh, correlations. And it's sited in a fantastic site on Jones Beach, which is on, in Long Island. It's a barrier island that was artificially created during the Robert Moses era by dredging up a lot of sand. Uh, we've already demolished two-thirds of this parking lot and this uh, building, designed by SOM in the early 60s, and we're using the recycled concrete to create berms to support the, uh, the landscape in the building. This is one of the better legacies of Robert Moses. Um, you know, this is Jones Beach a bit further to the east, um, a kind of a public space for a broad, broad segment of society. Our site is far to the west of that. It's a very natural place. It's just been designated a nature preserve. It's a very beautiful site. That's the existing building now, now gone. Um, so one of the goals in demolishing uh, all that uh, parking, if you will, is to immerse the building in some kind of landscape that would be returned to its uh, kind of natural condition, the dunes. Uh, and the linear form of the building emerges from a few constraints. We had to reuse the piles of the existing SOM building um, and keep it kind of a, you know, very, very sort of tight. Um, but also, uh, you know, it supports a kind of very long gallery that faces the Atlantic. And so the public will basically uh, walk through this series of open galleries around these other functions and encounter the kind of exhibits that uh, this new 320 foot long building will kind of uh, offer, kind of continuous gallery. So the, the goal of the building in, in, in a sense is to really uh, change people's mindset about how we consume energy and uh, how we can create a positive impact on the environment. It's built as a, a glue lamp timber frame. Um, clad in timber on the interior, although if there's a VE effort underway, that might disappear. <laughs> um, and it's a, a net zero building. It consumes, it produces as much electricity as it consumes using 350 PV cells and a, and a grid of geothermal wells. And what's interesting too is that the building will be the sub, one of the subjects of the exhibition in that uh, a, a, a display like a Prius will show you how it's performing relative to other benchmarks. We imagine it as a kind of a chalet for all. Uh, a building that's kind of like a Hamptons house for the public. It's free. <laughs> and it's surrounded by uh, a porch, as we call it, that uh, has a variety of conditions that promote different uses, but also different lighting conditions, different connections and views to the site. Uh, it's a building clad in cedar um, and very simple set of materials and systems, but all of these systems sort of slip one from the other. It's a kind of a continuous uh, sort of movement, if you will, between, between systems that are uh, never sort of reconciled. We had to raise the building seven feet above the uh, existing grade, so we are building up the landscape to, to meet it to some extent. So stay tuned. In a year, you'll be able to go there, I hope. Uh, this is just a model in our office. When, whenever uh, we do a project, we end up building a model, but it's just for ourselves. We never give it to a client, so that's a, kind of a consolation prize to have a model in the office. And as we've been exploring a range of possibilities at the, for the armature, which oscillates between its disappearance and its clear expression, we're asking similar questions at the boundaries of our work. Can the boundary be complete and incomplete at different places, in different times, or in different ways? Full confession, we love Gordon Matter Clark. We love making holes. We like cutting them into buildings, creating erasures from the shallow to the deep, basically to confound the limits between buildings and their context. It's also a sneaky act of transferring privately owned space to the public, extending the public's domain and the macro scale of the city into our work. So for us, the almost building is variably connected to, in, to its environments. And we see these limits not as a single thickness or an absolute, but as multiple layers, depths, bringing into the question, where does a building begin or end? In 2013, we were approached by the car company Mini 
to transform this warehouse in Brooklyn that Winka just mentioned, a 22,000 uh, square foot former uh, warehouse, into a design center. And we were so relieved that nobody brought up the idea of putting a car uh, in this building. Um, so the, the, at the time, the, the building's name was uh, Grassroots Box. Then it became Free Space, then it became ADO. And I mention this only to say that it's very interesting to work alongside the evolution of the identity of an institution. And the building's design sort of not only reflects it, but helps to, to form it. Um, Greenpoint is an interesting area. It's still uh, industrial at some level, but has a, a lot of other uses, residential and now hotels and bars. Um, and we were uh, kind of interested in several kinds of conversations that we could have with this existing building, uh, ranging from the kind of very explicit large transformation to the more subtle uh, kind of uh, conversations we could have through ambiguous change. So um, with all the many openings we created of this building, we had a lot of extra brick uh, covered in graffiti. So we had the idea to reuse this brick uh, to build it back as a kind of reconstituted graffiti. And we were kind of... Um, amazed to see that uh, the graffiti artists uh, didn't really honor uh, our intervention and they kept on graffitiing over the reconstituted <laughs> graffiti, <laughs> which was fine at some level. So this is a kind of a image, uh, the midway point. There's a lot more graffiti now, I think. Um, one of the biggest interventions we created was called the cut, where we removed a triangle of the building and rebuilt it in brick to create a kind of ambiguous reading of, you know, is it there? Creating New York City's newest and smallest uh, new public space. <laughs> Again, what Mimi mentioned about sort of our Robin Hood attitude. And this, public sp this new public space leads to a restaurant, which we also designed, um, and uh, which basically communicated some of the goals of the project, where, which were to remix physical and social and uh, also programmatic aspects of the project. So in this model, you see a series of different uses. Um, and uh, we were interested in the idea that they would kind of flow one from the other, basically the biggest nightmare uh, for the Department of Buildings. Um, but where possible, we tried to create uh, connect spaces like restaurant to what we call the free space, which is kind of a continuous uh, event space, uh, open to the public. It's like a free office. People can go work there uh, and use their Wi-Fi. Um, but there's also a little design shop and a workshop and an incubator uh, that is a sort of accelerator that um, develops both hardware and software uh, ideas to improve urban life. So actually, there's a lot of very interesting design conversations happening in this building. We also removed the roof of this part, which Mimi will talk about in a second. So for us, so, this kind of continuous uh, you know, connection across conversations between design and gastronomy were very important. Um, yeah, so we're interested in really messing with the physical and the cultural boundaries, starting with that cut that Eric explained. But we really see it as a deep construct, because that cut basically f flows into the free space, and then it goes onwards to the outdoor courtyard in the back. Um, this is a view from the restaurant into that free space. The free space is basically what, to our knowledge, the only free co-working space in the city. Um, but it is also something that is constantly changing. There are constant um, rotating new exhibitions from different artists, designers, um, constant um, roster of events, et cetera. Um, and it's really something that brings the design community together. Above the free space is um, a very big periscope, um, which um, started because the, the, the client wanted a rooftop uh, with views of Manhattan. You can't have a rooftop in this zoning. They couldn't afford it. But we said, don't worry. We will bring Manhattan to you. And so this periscope is, um, has um, reflects um, two um, angles. One is a view of Midtown Manhattan, where you can see the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building, and the other is Wyth Avenue in Brooklyn. So in our minds, this is the perfect merger of Manhattan and Brooklyn into one. Um, our client obsessively took photos of this because the light is always changing, um, as well as the content. And this is something that they we're really interested in. As the contents change, so does the quality of the light, um, the perception of space, the perception of the limits of our project. Um, this is the courtyard that Eric mentioned. Um, it used to be roofed. We told them, you don't need all this space. Um, this is excess space. So we removed it um, and really thought of it and the rest of the project as an armature that really invites people to interact, to engage with it, and to reframe how we see the neighborhood or even how we see our own project. And so it has hosted installations from Assemble Collective, from London, and most recently, or not re most recently, but um, also um, an installation by United Visual Artists. 
um, who um, installed this, and we were so ecstatic when we saw this because this was exactly what we wanted to happen, something that would completely reframe um, the, the context um, within which it sat. But it's also part of a larger goal um, as we're working on industrial projects and projects on the waterfront, kind of re you know understanding where zoning comes from, um, which is basically early 1900s, where zoning often produces these silos of use in cities for very good reason. Manufacturing was always pushed to these kind of um, outer neighborhoods towards the waterfront um, for environmental reasons, for, um, for all sorts of reasons. But now, as our waterfronts are um, being renovated, we are interested in opening up these new modes of production and making the work visible somehow, and also participatory, if possible. So on another waterfront in Brooklyn, we are currently working um, uh, for, the, um, for the city, for the um, New York City EDC. Um, this is another industrial site. Um, it's a campus for the garment industry. Um, we can understand that, of course, there are many pressures on our waterfronts. We need more public space. We need more density because we need more housing. But we also need to really keep spaces for manufacturing, which a lot of global cities like New York are losing. Um, so these are the two buildings that we're renovating, these two here. This is the existing site. But in, 19, in the early 1900s, which is when this um, entire complex was built, Brooklyn was the fourth largest manufacturing center in the country. And the Brooklyn Terminal, which is this campus, was the largest intermodal shipping, warehousing, and manufacturing complex in the country. But as air freight came into play, ships and the ships and the railways were abandoned. The pier buildings, which fronted this whole complex, disappeared. And so the storehouses that were in the back all of a sudden are now front and center um, on the waterfront, which is an opportunity for us to reconnect the city to the waterfront through these kinds of projects. So, um, so here are two buildings, and these are all now gone. Um, the project is part of a larger mayoral <coughs> initiative called Made in New York, which recognizes that we are losing manufacturing to overseas and to other cities that are less expensive. And so we are working on renovating these warehouses and turning what used to be very insular into much more visible spaces. These are the existing buildings. They were basically buildings with only doors, no windows, just doors that allowed the freight to come in from the water and straight out. So what we have inherited is a kind of amalgamation of many, many transformations. This is the existing context. So we are cutting. We're cutting into these buildings, trying to open them up replacing the rail that connected water to city with an interior public street, and acknowledging that there are many layers um, of history. Um, that's the first building. This is the second building, which is already a kind of Frankenstein, um, because it's already gone through its own renovation. And so we are mixing a slightly irreverent attitude and also a very respectful attitude that comes from the research of what these buildings are. Um, and trying to add these layers of intervention in a way that the new doesn't stand apart, but it remixes the old in unfamiliar ways. So at what thickness um, does uh, a boundary become a zone? Um, a boundary elevated to space. And if we progressively erase the zone, at what point does the building read as a so this is a question that's, of course, relative and varies to where you come from and your culture and your climate that you live in. Um, within this framework, though, we're very interested in Le Corbusier's Villa Baizot from 1928. Um, uh, each floor plate is ringed with a kind of a exterior space and it's different and stacked. So you can imagine this residual space as a series of incomplete zones, but then imagine them as Louis Kahn uh, was fascinated by as a series of uh, rooms in a thickened zone. We can sort of imagine the incomplete spaces in a building uh, sort of as a series of zones. 
So we can, if we move from the perimeter to the center of a building, we could start with the veranda and end up with a courtyard. If we think in section, we start with the raised modernist uh, you know, floating uh, ground floor to the loggia to the uh, covered roof. So in these sort of spectrums, in either case, we're interested in these spaces sort of erasures of buildings and the capacity for these to sort of inform what we call spatial structure, which for us is a notion that sidesteps the idea of, of type. So this project, before it became another issue of name change, before it became the New York State Equal Rights Heritage Center, uh, it really was just a visitor center that we responded to in 2017. Um, Auburn is uh, up in upstate New York. It's in the Finger Lakes in a very interesting area that throughout the 19th and 20th century was a kind of crossroads of progressive ideas. It's where Harriet Tubman uh, spent the last 50 years of her life and where uh, William Seward, who was Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State and the Governor of New York, also uh, lived and his building is right next to our lot. Our site was a former municipal parking lot next to a municipal parking garage. This was the last building the city built in like the early 80s. And so it was a kind of very charged context, both from the standpoint of sort of physical context and social context. As a sort of paradox, um, the city was very conservative about the physical context and very progressive about the social context. So that was a very interesting kind of question to, to reconcile. So soon after winning the RFP, a few weeks later, we walked out of a meeting uh, kind of poking ourselves like it just became uh, an Equal Rights Heritage Center, not just a visitor center. And then it became the New York State Equal Rights Heritage Center. And there was a, an incredible pressure to uh, complete this building really quickly. So we designed it and sent it out to bid at six months. And it was built nine months after that. So it was all, all, all told a kind of 19 month uh, process, which is kind of exciting. Um, so the. Uh, sort of process of thinking about this was guided by a challenge, which was that we were surrounded by relatively tall buildings and the budget only allowed for a, a single story building. So we really worked on how to not just articulate the form, but sort of <laughs> in a sense compete with the, with the context. And we looked at a lot of the local houses, which were much of the existing context, to kind of, uh, you know, really kind of couch yeah. our interest in this kind of uh, articulation of the building at some level to, to, uh, within the scale of, of residential buildings around. So the building is organized as three volumes um, with cores in between that position the observer always at the perimeter so that context becomes content. We realized that actually the historical context around us really should be part of the exhibition, which we also co-designed. Uh, and, and so we really tried to create a very simple building that allowed for the flow in a sort of a figure eight through these spaces, collecting back of house spaces in the middle of these cores and thereby creating a lot more surface area for the exhibition. So it's only a 7,500 square foot building, but it has to kind of live large, as it were, in this uh, very interesting uh, site. So here's a photo, a drone photo, showing how the Seward House is now accommodated in the interior as a kind of uh, part of the exhibit. So this is the image, the series of images, like screenshots that convince the client. Uh, and, and here's uh, just a few months later in a sort of very fast process. We used concrete uh, as partly because of speed. We wanted it to be the finished material and have less layers. But we were also really interested in a very elemental and primitive architecture. Uh, the wealth section maybe shows this a little bit, where with radiant heating and so on, we'd have just no kind of things, no layers, no uh, exposed ductwork, et cetera. So the exhibition really looks at uh, equal rights and the struggle for equal rights, focusing on uh, abolition of slavery, uh, women's rights, and LGBTQ rights. Also, there's labor rights in there as well. And the series of uh, exhibits are each sort of medium-based rather than thematic, uh, so that the crossovers between these really interesting topics can, can sort of be engaged. Um, so as you walk through the building, uh, we'd really try to alchemically create a larger building with a small building by creating all these views. Uh, we also designed custom furniture based on the uh, bathymetry of the local Finger Lakes, and really opening up views, again, alternating between content and context. So digital maps, a little uh, sound speech island, we call it, where you can sit down and listen to excerpts of speeches uh, told through the voices of uh, contemporary people. Um, and again, the sort of unfolding of space is something we're quite interested in, which some of these collages try to portray. But this is sort of at the nexus of uh, the two volumes where we have the social justice table, something that we designed as well, that has a sort of series of videos that t tell the story of, uh, about the struggle for, for equality. Um, and th again, the outside interpenetrates with the inside, constantly kind of telling the story of uh, the, the broader context and the broader history of the site. So after a lot of controversy and a lot of struggles with the local people who love their parking lot, um, <laughs> even though they have a parking garage right next door, and, and who love their historical context, uh, rightly so, uh, 
we're so happy that the building is sort of like the living room of the city now. And every Saturday, they have all kinds of things. And they have talk about appropriation. They have farmers markets. We also design the public space uh, and, and uh, uh, kind of a larger sort of context off-site construction. So this is on the opening day, uh, which is a very special day on November 18th um, in 2018, just now. Um, it, at, at that uh, special event, uh, the great-great-granddaughter of Harriet Tubman right here in the foreground was there. And I had the opportunity to speak with her. And I asked her, uh, you know, Ms. Tubman, uh, what do you think about the building? And she said, better than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very nice, if lukewarm. But <laughs> since then, it's been very, uh, this gives a little bit of a sense uh, about the kind of controversies that have plagued the project and have kind of disappeared. So we've explored this concept of the incomplete zone in plan and section in response to climate and culture in the next two projects. The first begat the second. The first is Villa Villa, um, which is um, was a crazy project, 100 villas, um, many uh, 100 architects invited. This is us here, a bit of a zoo of architecture. Um, in Inner Mongolia, um, a, a 10,000 square foot villa. Um, Inner Mongolia uh, was, is um, what China hopes to be the new energy sector. Um, it is a desert climate, and so our intuitions were shaped by two aspects. First is the extreme weather, is extremely cold and extremely hot and nothing in between. The second is who needs 10,000 square feet? Um, so our response was to wrap an outer house around an inner house, which is very much a thermal um, idea that you, um, you can fully heat the inner house, and the outer house is partially conditioned and is also the means by which you kind of expand and contract. Um, with Arab, we worked on the thermal modeling and built a 1 to 10 model where you can see the blue dots is extreme cold. That's the outside. The green dots, um, temperature dots, are um, around the outer house. And the red ones are all the inner house. Um, the three levels of the house are completely different in terms of their plan configuration. And when they stack, they create uh, this varying relationship between the inner house and the outer house. Um, in such a way that the, that kind of zone, the outer house, is this contiguous and also amorphous zone. The idea is that in extreme weather, you retreat to the inner house, and in temperate weather, you expand. So the concept of living expands and contracts seasonally. Um, it was never built. Um, which kind of explains the aesthetic of these renderings, this kind of half-abandoned construction site um, that we were going for in the rendering. Um, it, was canceled, it was canceled because the um, developer fell out of favor with the government, and then he went into exile in London. But we still kept thinking about this idea of an inner building wrapped around an outer building, and so we tried it again for the Shanghai Library. Um, this is not 10,000 square feet. This is 1 million square feet. So it's um, the same issue, but um, or rather same, yeah, same, same questions, slightly different scale. Um, at 1 million square feet, how do you accommodate the spaces for solitary work and intimacy and also address the institutional scale of a city library? Um, the site is right next to Century Park, which is their central park. And so we maximized the open space and kind of, in a way, borrowed the park environment into the library. We also took cues from the oldest library in the world um, at Tan Yuge, which is super fascinating because the ground floor, so this is a palace library. It's a private library. The ground floor is completely contiguous to the garden, and that was the reading room. The upper floor is where the books were kept, and this was very typical of um, uh, libraries in this era, keeping the books away from the moisture, the insects, the rot, etc. So we took that, the open floors and the compact floors, flipped it, and basically used it as the kind of binary code for the library. And so this, these alternate in section sandwiches of 
compact floors and open floors above. They alternate in section um, in, 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 in a way that it kind of grows the relationship um, between the building and the landscape as it multiplies vertically. The superimposition of the plans, which are all very different figures in plan, allows it, as it stacks, to produce these multiple height voids at the perimeter, which creates this idea of a vertically continuous library, which is the slow library. So for, we were thinking that structurally, the cores, et cetera, that's the fast route through the library, along the perimeter, along the pocket gardens and the, um, and, and the view towards the park is the slow library and the more casual one. And since paper was invited, in, it was invented in China, and also the printing block was invented in China, and the original printing blocks were terracotta, we thought it was appropriate that the, to skin the facade in terracotta, um, roughly scaled to the size of the book, which reveals in the evening the voids that um, are behind. Um, that is the kind of product of the, this complex section that through the accumulation of these incomplete zones in plan, you get this um, kind of in-between uh, casual library. So we uh, won, apparently, but then after the fact, we realized that we didn't win the real competition. We won the side competition that they ran adjacent to the real competition. So in fact, we didn't win anything, so we built a model, um, <laughs> which is what we do when we lose competitions. These models hang around in our office um, as a reminder to try it again next time. Um. This is a project in, in Canada that uh, has the unique distinction of being the only project uh, for which we were hired by a former student. So if you have any good students in the, uh, in the school, you should treat, treat them well. Our, our student went on to be a developer, an architect, and she ended up working in our office on the project, so it's really interesting. Uh, designed in 2014, it's a project called M2 for a very uh, difficult site in Calgary's East Village. Um, it's like, here's the model uh, that they, they built, showing a sort of simultaneous urbanism of these different buildings being built at the same time on, on what was uh, kind of em empty land. It's a very interesting site uh, in that it's along the, the river walk, which is a wonderful new public space along Calgary, but a very difficult one given its uh, shape and the zoning regulation, which required that we do not cast a shadow closer than 20 meters to the Bow River at a specific time. It's kind of like an Indiana Jones uh, moment. So that sh shadow envelope, as it were, uh, kind of dictated the form at some level. Um, and with the complexity of uh, having a parquet uh, below grade and therefore cores along the main city facade, we had to really think about uh, you know, how do we bring light in even through the uh, fire stairs and things like that. So it's a complex uh, little building that has restaurants on the ground floor, uh, offices on the second and third, and then a um, re uh, residence on the top. So here's a photo right now of maybe a few months ago under construction. Uh, all, all this other stuff happened since. <laughs> we had no idea it was going to be exactly what this would look like. There's a Norman Foster in a big building. It's a very interesting site because it's really kind of on the forefront of this new public realm in, in Calgary's East Village. We had very little budget to work with, so we worked with proportions, things like that. Uh, the very simple material, just ACM, aluminum composite uh, uh, pa panels that are basically hung on the facade. Uh, it's, it's nearing completion. It's a small project, but I guess it has oversized uh, ambitions. If you've ever been to Storm King Art Center, um, just outside New York City, you might have walked by this piece by Allison Schatz called Mirror Fence. Or you may have missed it because it tends to appear and disappear. In form, it's a doppelganger of a generic picket fence. But rather than divide space, this one kind of dissolves into a landscape of varying light, weather, and seasons. We are obsessed with similar ideas in our work. How can we register the impermanent context of our projects? How can the perception of buildings be folded into its surroundings, collapsing far with near, or object with field? We're, of course, drawing from a long discourse about ambiguity in architecture from Emson to Venturi to Rowe. Our focus is 
partly on conveying the material and temporal ambiguity, remixing context somehow and destabilizing the perception of architecture. So for us, the almost building is intentionally vulnerable to conflicting interpretation and really resists a stable identity. This is Chicago Navy Pier. If you've been to Chicago, you may have visited this pier as a tourist. If you're a Chicagoan, you never go because it's a tourist trap. Um, and it tells the story of American waterfronts, that there have been two kind of phases of development. The first through the 90s, um, waterfronts were turned into kind of festival marketplaces, intensely commercial, intensely um, about about retail, let's put it kindly. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and we can understand our work. So this is, um, well, this is the new one. But our, our work was, in a sense, clearing all of the clutter. So this was, this was the, the Burnham plan. Actually, Burnham uh, imagined five of these piers. Only one was ever built. But it has been everything from a university to military complex where there were um, um, uh, building arms for World War um, Two. Two. Um, and um, this was the festival marketplace waterfront that we inherited. So really, a, a lot of our work was just to erase, to clear the clutter, and to connect the pier back to the lake and back to the city. Um, we, we were the architects on this um, team, again, with James Corner Field Operations. We designed a series of structure, all of them in some way reframe reflect, re-engage the views of the lake and the city. Um, starting with the lake pavilions, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we just, you know, can we just like take a piece <laughs> of the lake and float it above our head? Um, because we wanted to reflect the water. Um, if you know Chicago, the lake is literally Caribbean blue in the summer um, versus really, it freezes in, in the winter. So it's a very drastic change. Um, and so we wanted to kind of combine um, the reflections of water with the activity of the promenade into this new plane. And as one of the long list of things <laughs> that we now know, um, this was a magnet for spiders <laughs> in the summertime. They loved it because the lake pavilions emit light in the evening and compounded with the reflective soffit. It was a feast. And so um, in the summer, the lake pavilions are covered with spider poop. But I guess if we are really talking about appropriation, that means people and spiders. So we have to live with it. <laughs> Marking the very beginning of the pier is this info tower. This is part of our play with scale and remixing context. If you stand at a certain distance, it looks like a skyscraper, which is several blocks beyond. So we're mimicking it's a kind of mini me of the Chicago skyline. Um, but it's actually only 45 feet tall. But it's clad in glass that has a chrome frit. Um, and there's more and more chrome flit, frit the higher you go. So it's, a, it's an object that is constantly changing, sometimes reflecting the fireworks, sometimes <clears throat> disappearing with the sky, which is, tends to be quite gray in Chicago. So it's something that's constantly changing. And then the light uh, inside is set to the moon cycle. So the, um, the newer the moon, the dimmer the light, the more full the moon, the brighter the light. We're playing with similar things on the Seattle waterfront, um, where they have t torn down the viaduct, which separated the city from the water. This is another project that we're doing with James Corner Field Operation. Um, in Chinese, I forget the word, but apparently there's f the, the word for borrow, there's four different words for borrowing. <laughs> Distant borrowing, adjacent borrowing, upward borrowing and downward borrowing. And we have tried to enact all of them in, in these kiosks, which um, are meant to kind of create a new skyline or waterline for the city, um, connecting the water to the city and vice versa. The funny thing about Seattle is that the higher, the more inland you are, the higher you are and the more water you see. The closer to the water you walk, 
the lower you are, and because of the orientation of the piers, the less water you see. So this is a kind of kaleidoscope, periscope that corrects that. So as you approach from the city, it's angled so that you actually see much more water than you would. Um, and the idea is that with this exact same kiosk, as you walk along the promenade, its identity and its presence changes by virtue of what it's reflecting which you can also see here, even if you move. So this is at the same point, 15 feet from um, 15 feet uh, difference in terms of the view, um, which produces an entirely different image of, uh, of the kiosk. And this idea that the reflections would be flickering, almost like an after image that stays with you, um, is what we're going for. Except they're only going to build one of them, we just learned. So, um, so even if uh, the perceived formal uh, or temporal ambiguity in architecture at a certain sort of visceral level is, uh, shall we say, we can understand it as something we intuitively uh, perceive, it's also very culturally inflected. But this is uh, even more so the case when we're thinking about uh, typological ambiguity. So the question is, is the Ponte Vecchio a fragment of uh, a street or a continuous building? Although it started as a, as a mere bridge, uh, it evolved typologically to the sort of ambiguous hybrid um, that is both, both and street and, and building. Um, we love thinking about this condition. You know, if something occupies a gradient from something to something else, um, it's almost something, and therefore some, almost something else, right? So what, what really is it? And in this case, it's almost a building. So this is another kind of almost building uh, in our minds, is the hybrid. So to paraphrase Rosalind Krauss, um, if you imagine architecture as a series of positions between uh, building and not building, we're interested in these sort of multiple uh, intermediate positions bet between them. So the simplest version of this is um, building a sign, of course. Um, we um, have been involved for a very long time with this project. This is the one of the five asphalt plants in the city. So it's an extremely inhospitable environment. Um, the first little building uh, is a monitoring booth for, um, this is for the Depar Department of Transportation. This is where their whole fleet is maintained, et cetera. Um, this is the monitoring booth for the diesel gas station. And it literally points to the direction of traffic flow. We're playing with, of course, road signage, et cetera. Um, this is the other building, which is an electrical transformer building. That little squiggle is the electrical diagram for stepping up in power. So the building does what it's, or houses what it says, or it does what it, <laughs> it does what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> We thought, it, we thought that this very ugly environment needed a little humor. Yeah. Um, so we were invited uh, in 2011 to create an art installation in Taiwan um, at, for an arts festival that is really kind of uh, celebrating the low carbon initiative of the government at the time. Uh, we asked the curator, can we do something useful? Can we create a space for, for gathering? And, and she said yes. So um, it's a very interesting site in the eastern uh, edge of, uh, of Taiwan called Hualien. Um, and it's, um, it's very beautiful, but it's also it's populated by a, a group of people called the Amis, who are non-Han Chinese. Um, and so we were interested in the way that they told stories uh, through dance and uh, would, uh, wanted to create a space that housed multiple people in, in one place. So we kind of decided to create a stage as a kind of a circle in the round where there would be less or no hierarchy between performers and uh, uh, viewers, but also uh, comprised of a series of sort of band shells, 11 band shells that we built out of bamboo. And this is one project we didn't build ourselves. After having built uh, MoMA PS1 back in 2004, we decided to uh, let other people do our work. But it's interesting, in this uh, collage, we're trying to document how the bamboo was harvested just nearby by our, our local partners, the Amis who built it themselves, and uh, how they then followed our drawings to create a series of warped uh, uh, vaults, which withstood several uh, typhoons. Uh, what really interests us here is, again, this kind of notion of a space that is ambiguous in terms of uh, relationships between performers and, perform uh, and viewers. And we love seeing these photos of Yuan Ban, who went to the sort of closing ceremony uh, in which we saw how it was actually occupied. Because we also imagined the performance you know, occupying the center. So that was, that was quite interesting and informed some of our work at Navy Pier. 
So maybe the largest scale of typological ambiguity is the largest structure that we did at Navy Pier, which we call Wave Wall. It's 500 feet long. Um, it's a big stair, or it's a wall, depending on where you are, or it's a landscape. Um, it was an existing plinth that we uh, expanded. And so on top is an existing amusement park. Below is retail. Um, the, pier, the, the entire length of the pier is actually a kilometer, 3,000 feet. It is an endurance test to get to the end. We thought that they really needed a gathering spot somewhere in the middle to kind of break the um, relentlessness of the pier. Um, we were responding to a brief, actually, that asked to, for us to handle the ADA um, access from the lower dock to the upper dock. Um, we rejected the ramp and, and just added uh, elevators and this 120-foot wide stair, which our co contractor told us was the Swiss watch of stairs, which we thought was a compliment. Um, but it um, starts as a vertical wall. It uh, starts to peel out uh, with louvers to provide shade and then back in um, to, to become the stair. And the louvers, um, which are steel, become the steel pan for the wood treads of the stair. And so it becomes this point, depending on where you are, of this kind of like overlook over the park or this kind of amphitheater-like setting, um, which reframes the entire pier back to the lake and back to the city um, and is the spectator space for their summer fireworks and performances, et cetera. The last aspects of ambiguity um, in this last set of projects were asking what happens when the almost building is considered at the scale of the building, uh, of the city, sorry. Soria Imata's Linear City, which you may know from 1882, proposed to blur the distinctions between industry, agriculture, and daily life. It was 500 meters wide, which is basically two long avenues, New York avenues, um, by however long humanity required. Linear City influenced the Soviet disturbance and the Japanese metabolist movements that followed. And we are in turn inspired by their typologically ambiguous combination of streets and buildings. But where the mega projects as infrastructure, um, the mega projects as infrastructure delineated very clear legible strips that separated their intervention from the city. We are visiting, we're, 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 we're inspired by their, um, the ambiguity between um, architecture and the city, but we're trying to straddle a fine line between absolute separation and um, uh, a more kind of ambiguous um, interweaving of our intervention within the cities. So, Key Party was a really fast project for us, but um, also very inspiring. It was for a storefront uh, at um, a storefront uh, exhibition called Manhattanism, where um, we were asked to speculate on new urban forms that might arise from our current sharing economy. So Key Party um, extrapolates on the culture of sharing, where life has been dispersed and completely atomized across the block. We're also projecting its corollary, which is a retreat from all the sharing to small private spaces. So city blocks are reimagined as overlapping dispersed homes um, where you live between several buildings. The logic being, if we take advantage of the economies of sharing, maybe we can expand the public realm at the ground plane. It's either a utopian or dystopian, depending on how you feel about sharing hypothetical Manhattan um, that for us is a field-like armature of amenities. A few years before that, um, we were invited to uh, enter the competition uh, that uh, Wink had referred to. It was called Adapt NYC by a developer. It was a developer-led competition led by the HPD agency, Housing Preservation and Development, uh, and the mayor's office under Mayor Bloomberg. Um, Mimi and I were very uh, 
wary of entering this competition because initially we felt that uh, designing such small spaces might be inhuman. We'd lived in a very small apartment in the East Village, like 350 square feet for a while. So remember that. But then we thought we should try and make it as <coughs> humane as possible. And so the project for us became kind of a very interesting uh, moment where we, where we looked at these issues. So Carmel Place is on 27th Street in Manhattan, uh, just west of 1st Avenue. Um, and it's really kind of uh, coming after a kind of very long uh, sort of national debate about housing that we could say uh, was galvanized by the photos of Jacob Rees and the Danish photographer in the book How, How the Other Half Lives at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, his photos kind of exposed the uh, urban plight of the working poor uh, and galvanized new legislation for better light and air and things like that. And so the paradox is that home sizes or household sizes have been actually uh, you know, growing since the Second World War in which the average home size was about 1,000 square feet, kind of peaking uh, 2007 before the crash uh, at about almost two and a half times that. But the paradox actually is that uh, household sizes, and we no longer say families, uh, we really think about households because of the diverse demographic conditions that uh, comprise households, have actually been going in the opposite direction. We have less and less so-called nuclear families. Uh, only 18% of New Yorkers are, are nuclear families. Uh, and this is a trend, of course, that we see throughout the world. And this data is getting a little old because we've been lecturing about this project for the last four years. Um, but it's, it's, it's really uh, something that is prevalent. And so it really makes us think a little bit about the home and the idea of the dispersed home and uh, where are boundaries between living and working and other things and mobility. So we thought of the idea of a dispersed house, uh, something that we're continuing to work on. We're working on a co-living project in Miami right now. Um, but backing up a little bit, the competition was uh, actually kind of a given to us, the Adapt NYC competition. Uh, there was an incredible body of research um, uh, produced by CHPC, Citizens for Housing Planning Council, and by the city itself. And so when we entered the competition, we wanted to participate in this debate about housing. We, we, uh, as part of our submission, we created a rendering that looked as if it were going to be built. We maybe thought that that would get it uh, <laughs> to select it. And many people published this afterwards saying that look is under construction. Um, but the project, uh, to describe it, that we proposed uh, was a 55 is a 55 unit rental apartment building comprised of um, studios, micro units, but ranging between 260 and 360 uh, square feet net, with a median of about 300 uh, square feet. Um, we uh, introduced a series of uh, features to make them as livable as possible, uh, meaning one of them being very great ceiling heights, but also a large amount of amenities <coughs> and a distribution of amenities in places that usually would be reserved for uh, more uh, higher income retail. So this is the uh, ground floor, conceived as an urban sort of street, uh, but that could also be used for a massive dinner for everybody, uh, it, it, hypothetically. And then uh, a gym as well and a little cafe. Um, the units basically are a sort of narrow spectrum of a single type, uh, uh, micro units. There's the only building in the city that is comprised only of micro units due to the uh, relaxation of two critical uh, um, zoning uh, laws. One is the density law that uh, Wink also described and the minimum unit size. But within that spectrum, we're interested in having a diversity of types. Um, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Diversity of types that have, uh, for instance, a little sitting area or a very small unit that, of course, corresponds to difference, a diversity in, in cost um, as well as lifestyle. Uh, the building is comprised of modules, 65 modules made in a factory, uh, and they're all united uh, at the kind of a scene in the, in the corridor. And this kind of shows you the pieces that come together, including the, the stair. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in our book, we're, we're, we have a series of drawings to try to give away secrets. This is actually how it was built, uh, really like Lego. We're trying to show how we uh, connected the modules and how we wove infrastructure uh, uh, th through them. Um, it was a fascinating project to work on from the standpoint of visiting sites. Uh, we had to visit the real site and then the factory site. And these were happening in parallel um, and at kind of a breathtaking, as breath breathtaking speed. So this shows a typical uh, day compressed into a few seconds uh, where, like in the Model T4s, the units would, uh, the modules would move along from one stage to another. Um, the project actually took quite a while to build for a number of reasons, but the really fun part was the stacking, or the setting as they call it, of the modules, which happened over a course of three and a half weeks. Um, all of these were uh, fully welded together uh, to create a kind of a moment frame. 
and in the end, the units have a, a kind of great light and air due to a few other things that we introduced. One is, uh, instead of having windows, we have terrace doors with a Juliet balcony with a structural glass um, pane in front. And these are eight feet tall, so you can open the entire door and um, really bring the light in. Uh, the ceiling heights were mentioned, but also a lot, of, a lot of storage and reconfigurable furniture. We decided explicitly not to have balconies because we thought it was so important to see the sky and the ground and to really just you know, feel that connection to the city. It was really funny when a New York Times editor spent the night there. She was the first person to live in the building, and she invited all her friends, and um, they had a dinner party. Our only regret was that they did Chinese takeout uh, and didn't actually cook because there's actually a pizza. full kitchen. Or pizza. Oh, yeah, pizza. <laughs> uh, but the point is, really, one could uh, live, live in this. And it was an interesting shift in public perception once people actually started going to the units because they felt, they felt kind of large. So it's kind of a David and Goliath moment with this little building surrounded once again by really tall buildings. Uh, but it's part of a larger conversation about changes uh, that are happening at the level of zoning and uh, re uh, regulations and just cultural shifts and thinking about, about housing. This shows the public amenity space that we love. It's the little salon and a kind of public area with a barbecue. And these are gates which have to open for FDNY, but that would allow, if, if, if everybody's friends, they can have a party on this level, basically. Um, the building is uh, clad in brick. It's a decision we made, uh, even though it's sort of counter to the logic of modular construction at some level. We wanted a really durable, uh, weather-tight skin, but also one that participated in the history of housing, the sort of conversation about history of housing, thinking about, you know, uh, the, the white 1960s housing blocks on, on t sort of to the south, and then the Nysha housing block, this kind of ugly great uh, brown tower to the north. How do we kind of insert ourselves within this kind of larger uh, framework of brick housing in, in New York? Um, the form is, is sort of conceived as a series of micro towers that each kind of respond to different zoning criteria or also uh, conceal mechanical equipment, things like that. So in our living room, seven large peas have invaded an Italianate landscape. This is the work of our friend and artist Nina Kachadurian. She uh, has a series of projects called uh, Seed Assignment in which she uh, creates artwork with things at hand, her dinner in this case and in-flight magazine. Um, it's, we're very interested and inspired by, by, by this and to, to think about uh, basically how architecture can uh, simultaneously occupy different realms and different scales. And it's also kind of for us a metaphor of practice with, if you think about it, um, the airplane cabin being our intellectual workspace and, uh, and being a space of full, uh, sort of a f full of constraints and possibilities. So in, in our book, some of copies of which are outside, um, we've put forward an idea of architecture um, that embraces imp the impermanence of things and uh, their perception. So while notions of the incomplete um, really question the sort of the physical limits of, of architecture, notions of ambiguity uh, question their perceived limits. So for us, the almost building is an act of resistance uh, and a constant reminder um, to remain open-ended. Thank you very much. Of course, Ooh. yes. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting lecture. I'm curious as to where the title of your book came from, just because the it's, one? I'm curious as to where the title of your book came from, because it's um, buildings and almost buildings, uh, not architecture and almost architecture. And I'm wondering if um, there's some sort of definition of the differences between the jargon that you guys use and a reason why you guys chose to use that instead of architecture in the title. Almost architecture, definitely not. Okay. Because for us, the architecture, I mean, to, uh, not to be coy, but you know, we, we don't, let's just say that we define architecture through many, many different lenses. Um, and um, we, you know, at the beginning of our career with what we had at hand with the installations and the, the the commissions that we were receiving, um, we tried very hard to make them like buildings. Um, and now we um, are trying to make the buildings capture the attributes of the installations, um, even though they're permanent. And so um, it's a play also on um, our obsession with 
building, um, that we are not interested in paper architecture, and we're very interested in the material expression, tectonic expression, and you know, working through all of that. And we have always steered clear from ideas competition. Um, and we've always, you know, just, you know, tried to really, um, I'm answering this really badly. No, you no. answer it. No, no, um, it's right. It's <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I think um, we're questioning the idea of architecture itself. Like, yeah. where's the limit? So, it's, it's it a building? Is it an almost building? Um, yeah. And, and so, so, yeah, so, you know, al almost architecture would um, convey the idea that, you know, an installation is not quite architecture, which is definitely not where we come from. Um, we are finding architectural opportunities in you know, ephemeral installations in furniture, in, you know, in large scale, small scale, et cetera, so. It's also like not every building is architecture, right? So we also have that level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yes. You got me. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I teach history here. Um, and I always understood. I'm sorry. I always understood your project um, microgrids in New York. It's kind of like you said, debate on minimum existence dwelling, and you also flagged kind of that in the beginning you were kind of wary what it would mean to basically go back maybe to a debate like that. But I also realized as you were showing the project that actually it has much more to do maybe with precedents like. Um, apartment for the single woman. So there are other, I guess there's a, a whole other realm of precedence that I thought I, I wasn't aware of and I thought was very interesting. So I guess my question is, what is the social vision behind it? What are the precedents you were thinking with? Or are we beyond kind of similar social visions? Um, that, yeah, I'm interested in that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I teach housing at yeah, and it's one of the topics we, we uh, debate a lot. I mean, the origin of housing, we have projects that are sort of at the edge of housing. We have uh, monasteries, sanatoria, uh, hotels, and hospitals, and things like that, that, where the idea of the unit or the apartment as an intermediary step between the room and the city is, is not, not, not present. And so we have collective societies uh, that now seem to have the neoliberal uh, kind of conditions that in some, some ways have been uh, sort of re re recouped. But we see it more as kind of uh, just one kind of plank in, in a many sort of faceted set of solutions that need to address the issues of density and efficiency in life in the city, but also changing demographics. If, you know, if a person really wants to live alone and not share with three or four roommates in an illegal apartment, or you know, that's, that's an interesting choice, especially if they have uh, shared uh, amenities in the building, they like surpass amenities. I think in our goal for other projects, we want this to be even more of an expanded house. Uh, ideally, so in this project, within the limitations we had, we wanted to at least contribute to main, you know, dwellings that have a connection. But yes, we have, of course, I mean, Alto Van Eyck, There's a lot of, I mean, SROs are a, a taboo, but actually are being kind of repackaged by developers as kind of something amazing uh, with maybe better amenities and branding. So there's, uh, it's important to be ha uh, skeptical uh, of, of these things, but also maybe to participate in a way to make make them better. So we're interested in the evolution of housing uh, that's, that's, that's happening at this moment. I mean, we, we, we cannot go back because there's so, there's so many accessibility laws in place, rightfully so, right? Um, if you look at the plan of Carmel Place, it looks like a building of kitchens and bathrooms because those kitchens and bathrooms are handicap accessible. So, and, and there's minimum room sizes and all of that. So, um, so we're not going back to tenement housing, but there's also a larger social question about ownership. And, um, and, you know, you all, your generation, are not buying cars, um, cannot afford necessarily to buy houses, etc. So it's a question of how can we, um, you know, rethink how you live collectively, not just within your four, four walls of your apartment unit, but dispersed throughout your building, ex et cetera. It's also, I guess, a question of density relative to urban sprawl. I mean, we need to find, I guess, ways to make the city livable and viable in a sort of a pedestrian way, uh, we think. But I think we can't just think of housing. We have to think of infrastructure, education. We have to think of all the sort of facets of society, and they need to move 
kind of in concert. So I, the question of context is important when thinking about a project, I think, in, in this case. Is it part of the city? Again, ambiguously, is it a building? Is it part of a larger set of policies? You know, things like that. Yeah. Thanks for a good question. A couple more. Uh, one over there and one over here after that. interesting question because uh, we are increasingly having the opportunity to have that conversation with the client so that the identity of the building emerges alongside the design. So at the Jones Beach Energy Nature Center, we are also we're kind of the lead in looking a lot at the exhibition integration and thinking about uh, curatorial topics also because it's not well beyond the sort of mandate of the architect. Same thing with uh, New York City Equal Rights Heritage Center and ADO, but I think we're seeing a shift away from the idea of program to the idea of uh, uh, sort of amenity, that we can provide amenities, whether it's as simple as like electricity and Wi-Fi, whatever, or heat, and then provoke uh, appropriation. So I think we're going to see more and more shift away from top-down ideas of programming, for, of which we were always, we've always been suspicious because these are like lists, and people don't use spaces in that way. So we, we try to actually steer the client away from that and think about possibilities, what an, an enactment of potential. Like how do we provide things to the space so that things can happen and they may not be what you expect. And that's something we learned when we did PS1 in 2004. I mean, where you said, this is the dance floor and this is the, you know, some of that happened, but some of it didn't. And it was fascinating just to observe, this is 2004, at the beginning of our career, how people just do what they want. I think also there's, you know, in our minds, there's a difference between the program as in the, the brief that you are given and pr the programming of the space. And very rarely do they match at the beginning. Um, and um, I, I think also, you know, we work with a lot of public agencies. Um, Always the mandate is for it to be public, but that is the most overused word in architecture, the most unrefined, the most un, you know, and unnuanced, if that, if that's a word. So um, that might be their desire, but we are, you know, we spend a lot of our time um, showing them through visuals exactly what does public mean at what scale, what time of day, how does it change over, what are the different publics that they, um, they should be bringing in, what do they look like, what, what would they want. You know, so just kind of unpacking the, you know, the most vague and generic word um, into many different ideas of public bodies um, and, and programming. I think there's a question over here. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for the great lecture. Uh, I, I have maybe it's a little bit of an oddball question, but I, I saw a lecture of yours about 10 years ago now. And in that lecture, somebody asked you to explain the origin of your name. Oh, dear. Uh, and I think you gave a very eloquent, you know, multifaceted <laughs> answer to that. Uh, one of the ones that stuck out to me was, um, you know, you liked how N as a, is often used as a mathematical symbol to, um, you know, stand in for a number of any number of numbers, like taking something to the nth degree, architecture to the nth. So, uh, is now I've done all this work. Well, first of all, now we say that uh, we chose our name because nobody, including Winka, can pronounce our names. It's Bunge, by the way. Okay. <laughs> it depends whether you're Dutch or American. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. We're still interested in this idea of uh, the variable change, flexibility, appropriation. It was a sort of a manifesto name, as it were, from the beginning, kind of an articulation of what we wanted out of architecture. Um, and yeah, it's still relevant to us. And it was also this question of like, is it going to just be the two of us? Uh, will it grow? Like, what's the identity of the firm outside of our name? Nobody can pronounce our names. So there are a lot of uh, 
those questions. But I think your question is not about the name, but like sort of taking stock. Well, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary in November. Uh, everyone's invited. No, we haven't even celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and we're trying to maintain that youthful spirit in these bigger projects. They're now like $50 million projects, or whatever. Actually, the one Mimi showed is triple that. Um, so, and, and yet, how do you still like you know, maintain something that is connecting to people, that is transforming, that can be appropriated. That's frankly a struggle. I think the um, title of our book articulates that uh, that struggle, that we're working between buildings and almost buildings, and that we're always trying to maintain that spirit, but it's not always possible, which is hence the Rodman crowd spectrum, that we're still kind of working in this kind of space, but trying to be explicit and conscious of it. Uh, so that's the growing pain, which is really uh, interesting for us to be aware of through the creation of a book. Okay. It's also, you know, n as an in integer, it's a variable, right? And so we think about this a lot in our work, what is systemic versus what is the variable in, in, in the work. And it's a question that we ask within the project, but also thinking about, you know, a group of projects together. Um, what are their similarities? What, what is systemic about our approach? And, and, and how can we make it more systemic um, in terms of whether it's you know a conscious evolution um, in typology or a conscious evolution in the agenda for for the project, but then what is the variable? Um, whether you know it's context or clients, um, etc., that um, that enables us to never do the same thing twice. Um, or to make frameworks adaptive or uh, design yeah. uh, strategies not so top down, that they more, more resilient and responsive. So that the variability comes into play often as a design strategy, actual elements and transformations of things, if you will. So yeah. to, to be more direct um, about how we think we're doing, I, I think that um, often, often it's very difficult um, when we interview for a project, and um, we don't have 10 of one project type um, because we're interested in varying, et cetera, right? Like, it's, 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 um, it's a constant struggle because sometimes we come in and they're like, what exactly do you do? You know, what are you good at is, is a very hard question to, to answer. Almost so. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or any client. Yeah. 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 That's right. It's, yeah. I just had a quick question. It's for the. It's for the camera. camera. It's for so posterity. It's, okay. Oh, for the camera. First of all, thank you so much for that very interesting lecture. Um, what was uh, really fascinating to me is to see how heartless solutions are almost kind of a quicksilver, a flash, a kind of um, uh, uh, gathering together of kind of continued conditions of almost seems uh, without authorship. But yet, when you look at them carefully, clearly there's a set of uh, themes, sections, kinds of wrappings, kind of apertures, and the relationship you go from project to project to project that are, while they're modest, they're actually quite significant as a signature. Um, I'm kind of wondering, you know, how that, um, and this is sort of biased by a discussion I was having this afternoon about Siegfried Gideon, which we don't need to get into, but I think how does that maintain its uh, resonance as you get bigger and bigger projects, or the question of how architecture operates in the civic dimension comes up, where the kind of mass of the building becomes something that doesn't hold on to that possibility, uh, how do you see your work changing in the future because you are getting bigger and bigger buildings with much more <coughs> prominent uh, a condition of public nature that work? Yeah, that's a scary question. Um, <laughs> actually, we're also trying to uh, resist some bigger projects. Like, we just had an opportunity to design a tower in a financial district and we decided not to pursue it. We thought it wasn't right a moment for us, or maybe we're not interested in towers, actually, really. We didn't show a tower, we finished in Hong Kong, actually which is uh, another whole big story. But um, you just asked such a central question, it's almost another lecture. But I think every project scale has a corresponding scale of ambition. 
and has a scale of operations that uh, we can work with. And so what we try to identify is where's the project. And so many of our early design efforts, like concept design, level, if you will, is try to identify the uh, kind of the area of authorship or agency, like where we'll, where we'll say to a client, you know, we think that we can make this project su succeed if 90% of it is tried and tested at some level. Maybe it's a technical level uh, to meet the budget, but here's the 10% of innovation. And we want to really focus on this and and hopefully it's not a wrapper, actually. We're not so interested in the skin, which is why we talk a lot about zones and armatures and boundaries, where we really try to go you know, in, in depth into the building, if you will. So it's such a difficult question, but I think we're, we're conscious of it, and we're always trying to adapt, if you will, to, to the scale. We, we are interested in larger scale because we want to create very public work, but not for its own sake, just more to connect to people. So yeah. Stay tuned. I, I don't know. Do you have a better answer? To that? I think it's I'm just, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we're wrestling with, but um, the tower that Eric mentioned, I mean, in all of our projects, we're trying to c connect macro to micro, micro to macro. It doesn't matter which project we're working on. So the tower in Hong Kong is 400 feet tall, um, and we really struggled with it um, as a typology, but um, you know, we um, the the main uh, facade intervention was these balconies where the soffit was angled so that when you arrive home and you look up, as a mirror, is a, a mirror. Um, it it picks up the reflection of the sky, which is const is constantly going to change, and then from the inside, it reflects the street level, which we felt you know like that that was just a reaction to Hong Kong very alienating environment, super interesting street, and then super alienating environment in the towers, and we wanted to connect the two. So that is coming from just really thinking about a kind of micro scale, um, and then expanding it to the scale of the tower. Maybe maybe that's a, another aspect of how we're trying to um, That's the way to answer the question. We don't make bigger moves. We just make smaller moves and add them up. Yeah. <laughs> In that case. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you.